okay i think we're live hi guys my name is muskan ct team focus as pro from india and you're watching the fifth episode of off the belt today our guest needs no introduction wsop hall of famer he started a new era in poker back in 2003 when he turned 86 dollars into 2.5 million dollars with a name that seems too good to be true let's welcome chris money maker <laughs> hi good morning or evening i guess for you yes how's it going for you how's the lockdown been i believe you're at home chilling with your family doing home games i don't know what all tell us uh honestly it's been relatively easy pretty good for us um been doing a lot of work around the house um just staying at home staying away from Hi. people um it hasn't been really that bad the only thing that you know i kind of miss and um i wish i could do more was or do some of it's play online poker um or play live poker or any kind of poker um you know it's kind of a weird time obviously but um shave my head and coloring it blue today the kids are going to color my hair blue they colored all theirs yesterday um oh that's so cute <laughs> yeah i you know it's like you know you're going to color my hair blue i got to do interviews and stuff they're like it's short anyways dad no one will know so um <laughs> If we'd, done this interview, if we'd done this interview in about 12 hours, I would have blue hair. Um, so oh thankfully God. we're doing it now. I think is that the reason why we couldn't do a podcast earlier? <laughs> just joking. <laughs> Let's just make that up. <laughs> okay, so, you know, to be honest, this is a really special moment for my podcast, at least, because the man who was single-handedly responsible for the biggest boom in poker, uh, the moneymaker effect, you know you're here with us uh tell us uh, what did 86 dollars mean to you back then take us back well back in 2003 i had about 200 bucks on my online account um what people don't realize back in 03 on poker stars for example the sunday million was the sunday like 200k um the big game back then like the big uh, game online was 510 limit um they had one two no limit the tournaments were all like 10 and 20 bucks it was a really small um there was no really such thing as online poker and uh everybody that played online poker was considered kind of a second second class citizen when it came to um playing live poker when we came out to play in the world series back then um people thought we were just we were playing checkers and they were playing chess Um but anyway so I had 200 bucks in my account and I registered for an $86 tournament so I'll tell you how good I was with bankroll management back then um and I had about 8000 in credit card debt living paycheck to paycheck um yeah it was tough i mean you know I mean a, uh was the airline uh, that airline crash that ha- like happened the market crashed back in 2003 or 2 uh, did that affect you and you know you were basically an accountant and you know i i i got like i saw your documentary and you know i learned that you know you were going through a lot back in back then and it wasn't tough Yeah, I had a really good job um with Deloitte and Touche, which is a, a huge accounting firm. And then 9/11 happened, the uh when the World Trade Center got attacked by terrorists, and basically it shut down travel in the US for a little bit of time, which is kind of eerily eerily similar to right now, but anyways, I digress. Um so after about 3 months, we were all everybody that was hired with me got let go. So I was unemployed for 6 months. and during that time is when i started i started playing online poker and um uh, in my job search i was kind of supporting myself playing online poker um and finally i found my job and um uh, really was fortunate to stumble upon a really good job right before i won a seat into the world series main event and i told everybody i'll see them on monday even if i win the tournament i'll be back for work uh, which they were nice enough to give me a week off work to go um play in the poker tournament um and i was back at work monday morning at 8am 
imagine. So you accidentally registered into that tournament? Like you were, you had no intentions of playing it? Wow. I wasn't going to put $86 of my 200 hours into a satellite. That doesn't make all, to, to another satellite. Like this satellite got me to another satellite, which then would have gotten me into the main event. And back then you couldn't sell your seat to the main event. So you had to take it. Um, the problem with poker stars back in those days was the lobby wasn't broken up to where you could see what was satellites, what was cash games and sit and goes didn't run that often. I like playing sit and goes back then. They were just super easy. Literally, if you folded for the first three levels, you would almost be heads up. It was, it was crazy. People played sit and go so bad. It was just almost comical. Um, but they never really went off. It was very rare that you would ever see one go off. So whenever you saw one that was eight of nine or 15 of 16, you would always jump in there and try to get it going or try to be the last one in. Um, and that's what happened in this, in this situation. There was eight of nine people or seven of eight, I, I, whatever it was back then. I think it was eight of nine. Um, I jumped into it and uh, about halfway through realized I was playing a satellite and I was quite upset. Uh, didn't want to be playing this satellite because it got me into a tournament the next weekend. It was a $615 buy-in. Um, and I would have to win that one then go to Vegas and try to win a tournament in Vegas. And we all know that's never going to happen. So um, I was pretty pissed off. Yeah. You were trying to finish in fourth place. That got you like eight, eight K USD. Yeah. Oh during the 615 tournament, they were giving uh, three seats uh, to the main event. And then fourth place was 8,000 in cash. So yeah. I tried to position myself to take fourth place. And I was actually with five left. I was negotiating to get myself <laughs> fourth place. And honestly, if you would fast forward probably two, three years, I would have taken fourth place because you could sell your WSOP seat. Um, back then, poker stars didn't allow you to transfer it, sell it, do anything with it. You had to play. Um, but shortly thereafter, you could sell your seat. You could take it for T dollars. You could, I mean, there's 0% chance I play the main event if I'm able to sell my seat. Um, so it's kind of a good rule for me anyways, but in other situations, obviously it's much better to be able to sell your seat and pay off the, the bills. Obviously you're just not going to go ship the main event just because you won the seat. Yeah. But like in this way, your dad was so helpful. Your friends, uh, they bought your action. And they were like, okay, don't worry, you got this, you go. And was like, do you think everything happens for a reason? Like, what oh, happened sure. there? Yeah. yeah, I'm a big believer in everything happens for a reason. I mean, um, I'm not a real religious person, but I do believe that, you know, things are happening for reasons. Honestly, like this pandemic, I don't know what the reason would be, but um, whatever. Um, but yeah, I do believe things do happen for specific reasons yeah and now you're there did you prepare yourself mentally at all uh before the main event uh because you were playing such a big field and you know uh what like what was going through your head at that point we, we gotta realize one one poker was a lot different back then um i knew only three poker players by name i knew doyle brunson johnny chan and phil helm those are the only three players i knew by name or by that i could pick out of a lineup I remember I played with Phil Ivey and all these other guys. I had no idea who they were. Could I mean couldn't pick them? You know, couldn't tell you anything about them. So ignorance is bliss sometimes. First of all, second of all, there's not a whole lot you can do to prepare for poker back then. I mean, there were a couple books out. There were very limited resources um, which you could find back in 2003 that talked about um, tournament poker and strategies. Um, so the only thing that I did is I, my buddy went out and bought me a pair of sunglasses and then I just said, I'm going to count to five seconds in my head before I make a decision. Uh, one to not give off any tells and two to really think about what each decision means and to make the best decision I can. Um, I actually wish I would start doing that sometimes. <laughs> In, in today's game, um, slow down and make some think about my decisions a little bit more. But that that was really the only two things I did to prepare. Um, I did go out to Vegas four days early, five days early before the main event. And the money that my dad and my buddy had given me 
to go out and um, pay off some bills. I actually took a portion of that and went and played sit and goes and small, no limit tournaments, like, you know, $20, $30 buy in tournaments, just so I could acclimate to playing no limit Texas Hold'em live because I'd never played it before live. Um, again, if you go to a casino back then, they didn't have daily tournaments, they didn't have no limit Hold'em. It was all limit. You, you could play 5, 10 limit, 10, 20 limit, and that's it. Um, you couldn't walk into a casino and say, I want to play No Limit Texas Hold'em. And just did, they didn't have it. Uh, poker rooms, you know, never offered that. So unless you were in Vegas, maybe L.A. Um, is the only opportunity you had to play No Limit Texas Hold'em. So I went out a week early, just or a couple days early, uh, just so I could sort of get acclimated and see if I had any tells and see if I could pick up any tells and things of that nature. You were technically learning on the job. I saw uh, day three, Johnny Chan had to remind you, it's your go. And you were like, you got a little, uh, you were caught off guard. What, were you, what happened? Like, were, And then you knocked him out. Oh my God. Like, what was that experience? Um, day three was probably the most nerve wracking and surreal day of my life. Um, First of all, I wake up and I can't find my table. I know I was, I mean, I'm pretty sure it was table 33. I can't remember the exact, I'm, I think it was table 33. I'm looking around, I can't find it, I can't find it. So, um, you know, and it wasn't like, you know, today if you go to a poker table and they have a live stream, you actually go to the table and it's all set up and they say, go to the live stream table. Yeah. Well, here at Binion's, they just take the table away. There's no table. So it's like gone. So I'm walking, I mean, I'm just looking like an idiot walking around. Finally, I asked the tournament director, so, or one of the tournament boys, and said, yeah, I'm looking for my table. And they're like, oh, you're on the TV table. I'm like, oh, <laughs> yeah, this is a nightmare to me. Um, you know, first of all, I'm going against Johnny Chan. I'm going to be on what I consider live TV. Um, so I was concerned about, you know, scratching my nose, picking my nose, doing something embarrassing. I didn't want to embarrass myself on national TV or on, you know, network TV in front of my friends and family. And me being my younger self really didn't take into consideration that all this stuff is edited very heavily and they're not going to be putting out every single hand. So, you know, I didn't want to make a mistake playing a hand. I didn't want to do something um, that looked silly. Um, so I was extremely nervous. And we start playing, and the hand that happened where I forgot I had a hand was probably 30 minutes to an hour into the day. It was really early into the day. Howard Letter and Johnny Chan were in a hand, and I was trying to study them to pick up any information. Yeah. And I was studying so hard that I forgot that I had a hand. And, uh, yeah, that the whole thing went down like that. The good thing for me is I quickly realized – that there's not much else I can do that's going to be stupid that is as dumb as what I just did, forgetting I had a hand. So that took a lot of pressure off, um, knowing that, you know what, it's not a big deal. I forgot I had a hand. I've kind of done something stupid already, so um, it'll be all right. And then when Johnny's hand said something to the effect of, don't worry, kid. That won't make it on. That won't make it on TV unless you win. Um, <laughs> I started thinking about. You know what? They do edit everything here. That'll never make it on TV. No one will ever see that. Um, so, yeah, I, that I was... guess I'm glad everybody did see it because uh, Johnny was right. If I didn't win, yet no one would have ever known that I forgot I had a hand. No, no. It was, I mean, imagine you even uh, made quite an impression on Phil Ivey. I saw one of his interviews and he's like, I looked at him and I knew he has, he had a shot, you know, he's like, it's like, you know, sometimes you can tell the winners at the gate. He like looked at you and he knew that, you know, you're going to win the main. And how, we, how come you were so fearless and confident that, you know, you were able to hold your own in front of such big names? Yeah, I mean, I don't know. You can, I guess you can just see it in people. I remember playing a very late night session out in LA many, many, many years ago against these two young guys. And as I'm playing three handed with them, we're talking. And I realized, you know, these two young guys are good. They have it. They're going to make it. They're going to be 
really good poker players. And this, no one knew who these guys were. They're just brand, two random guys at four in the morning, grinding, playing five, 10, no limit. Um, but these guys were really, really good. And uh, I told them that they're real good and they're going to do really well. And that it was Phil Locke and uh, uh, Antonio Svendari that I was playing with. Obviously, they did pretty well. So I, th I think, you know, everybody that I've played with um, that I thought was going to be really good has turned out to be pretty good. I actually, you know, we did a fish and chips type thing for poker stars many, many, many moons ago where we went <laughs> fishing and then we had a little poker tournament down the PCA. And there was a player there that we were playing with. I had won the World Series, obviously, by this time. Um, I was playing with a guy and he was a young guy. But he really impressed me to a point where I went to him. It's like, hey, you're, you know, you're a hell of a player. Love to talk to you about coaching. Maybe you can help me out a little bit and see what I'm missing. And uh, obviously the guy looked at me kind of like I was stunned. Um, but we became friends and he helped me out. And uh, his name's many people may not know who he is, but his name's Calvin Anderson. He's one of the most successful online players in, yes. in history. And uh, huge, respect, huge respect for him. Like he was one of the first pros I met when I went to WSOP. And oh my God, he he's so inspiring. And even online crusher, as you mentioned. Yeah, online crusher, just a, a great human. Real, I mean, um, we have diverted on our views of life because he's a very healthy individual and I am not. So... <laughs> Hey, we actually went down to the Bahamas one year together, and he told me he would pay for the entire trip. He would pay for my food, my room. He would pay for everything as long as I just stopped drinking caffeinated drinks. <laughs> so I went. He, was, he when we got to the island, he literally went and bought fresh coconuts and was like chopping the top off fresh coconuts and just drinking coconuts and doing all this. We went to meditation. We did all this stuff. And I made it for about a day and a half. And uh, finally, I said, you know what? I'm just going to pay for all my stuff. I'd rather drink a Coke than get the whole trip paid for. And I was having such bad headaches. I couldn't play poker. We were. It was funny because we were both down there for the scoop. I was flying down there on a lark just to go play um, the scoop. And I texted him. I said, hey, where are you playing scoop? Yeah. And, you know, this is after Black Friday, so you had to leave the country. Um, and he said, I'm headed to the Bahamas to go play. And I said, well, damn, I'm on a plane right now, you know, heading that way. We're messaging. And, uh, so he's like, well, just, you know, drop, dump your room, come, come stay with me and we'll grind together. So it was a cool experience and a lot of fun. And, um, again, we went and did yoga and all this weird stuff, but, um, yeah, he's definitely a lot more in tune with, uh, his natural healthy person. Yeah. That way. So basically, the fact that you're so unpredictable and, you know, you, you'd played with pros before, you basically, you had no pressure. You were able to, you know, go into day five and, you know, you bluffed Sammy Farah. Oh, my God, the biggest bluff in the century. I really want to know, was it about something about the boat texture or did you have a feeling like if I, if I go through that hand history today, it's like, I feel like you did have implied odds to call, but were you mentally prepared that I'm going to blow this spot out of proportion and I'm going to try and steal it or take it down? I want to know what was going through your head. So first of all, we got down to heads up. What, I, what some people don't know is we talked about making a deal. Uh, me and yeah. Sam Proha, you know, went, went away from the table and we went to make a deal and he basically insulted me saying that, he needed more money. I offered a 50, 50 split. He said he needed more money and I had a two to one chip lead. So that really just more or less pissed me off. Um, but it gave me a lot of insight into his thought process as well. And the fact that he thought he was that much better player than I was. And back then, even, I mean, playing with Sammy, I played with Sammy for like two days. And the one thing I realized about Sammy is he, he was the ultimate guy of, He's going to bluff the pros and never bluff the fish. He was always super aggressive playing with, with people like Phil Ivey or Amir Vahidi, people that were established pros back then. But when he played against myself, maybe Tumor Vivinisti, uh, some of the other, you know, recreational amateur online players, whatever you want to call it, he was not as aggressive. He was a lot more selective and he valued us more and didn't, you know, apply a ton of pressure. 
So knowing all this information and watching this over two days, I knew that he wanted to play small ball with me as best he possibly could and use his experience. Um, I just knew that I could, you know, play big pots with him and I could run him out of pots. I knew he wouldn't want to go broke with just one pair and kind of how the hand dynamic went down. I was pretty confident he didn't have a straight and he didn't have a flush. So uh, obviously I know I'm beat, but, I'm pretty sure he only has a one one pair, and Sam Farha doesn't want to lose the World Series of Poker with one pair um, to an amateur, twenty hands into heads up play. Um, thank goodness I was correct. Um, but the one thing I saw when he folded, he was very agitated. Um, he didn't like folding top pair. He was really really upset. So I told myself if I pick up a big hand in the next two, three, four, five hands, I'm going to bust him. I'm going to get all his chips because he's frustrated and he's, you know, I've been re-raising him and, and pushing him around a little bit. Uh, once we got down to three handed, um, he was picking on Dan Harrington, who was the third place finisher. And I was picking on him um, because, you know, again, he was kind of more pushy with the pros. So he was always pushing Dan Harrington around. Um, and I would be, more or less picking on him. And he was, you know, again, he wasn't picking up hands against me and uh, he wasn't bluffing me. So anyways, I could tell he was really frustrated. And it just so happened the very next hand, I pick up the, the hand that won the, for the four five versus the 10 Jack and he flopped top pair. And yeah. the second that, you know, we got it all in, I knew I was going to win because I'd never really taken a bad beat. Poker was great. Um, yeah. Uh, it, it was I have to I have the hand history here. You had like king of spades, ten of hearts. He had queen of spades, nine of hearts. Mm -hmm. And the flop is nine of spades, deuce of diamonds, and six of spades. And basically, I feel like he was regretting the fact that he, uh, you know, bet. I guess once you, you know, raised him. Did you raise him on the flop? Is that what happened? We we check check the flop, and then we all the all the action started picking up on on the turn. Yeah. Um, he eight bet, of spades. yeah, he bet then I raised and Matt Savage said, you know, that I called and I had to correct it. No, I raised. And, um, so I think he bet like 300,000. I made it 500,000 more. And, uh, when the river bricked off, which I don't even know remember what the river was, but you probably I, do. No, I, I just have the third here, but yeah, it was a, it was a break. Um, Someone, someone from the chat will tell us. But yeah, it was a break, and basically, you, um, you know, just that's that's when you went all in, and it was just yep. pre, pre decided all, decision, basically. I went all in. I shut my eyes, and I imagined I was at a beach somewhere doing something else, not having what I thought was one of the better players, uh, poker players of, in the world, playing heads up for the most prestigious poker tournament in the world. And I just put all my money in with no no pair. So yeah, I was just trying to imagine I was somewhere else. Yeah, perfect. And now imagine you won, like you won the main event, and you are the world champion. I mean, how does it feel to know that that you know you won the World Series of Poker? And did you sleep well? What was the first thought next morning? I want to know that. Like, what was going through your mind? Honestly, I don't remember the first couple days. Um, we went out drinking that night. We got down about three in the morning um, and we went straight to the bars, went straight to drinking. They carried, they had to, I'm sorry. Who all went? Uh, my friends that were out there and then a lot of the dealers. Um, I just said basically anybody wants to go, go. Obviously, when you win the main event, you pick up a lot more friends really quickly. Um, I did have a, a couple of buddies out there with me that were out there celebrating that would had fought, been following along with my journey. So uh, we went out and um, Bruce and Dave Gamble, the two people that had uh, been out there with me, and we went to the club. Uh, after we were done, we had to fly out the next morning. They had to like, physically carry me onto the plane to get home. Um, <laughs> yeah, it was bad. I mean, I. That was that was during my heavy drinking days. And so I went home and got home on Sunday. We had a big party where I worked at a restaurant on Sunday. Um, and then I did show up for work Monday morning. Um, like I said, I would. 
Um, but I would work and then I would basically go to the golf course and drink a lot. And that was my next couple of weeks. I was getting phone calls from David Letterman and, um, uh, yeah, who was the, they, uh, Jay Leno, uh, to do these night nightly shows, you know, the, the night light, the, the late night shows and public speaking to me was the biggest fear of my life. So there's no way I was ever going to do these. Um, even me doing this with you right now, just having this, knowing that other people are potentially could be watching would have given me tons of anxiety uh, back in the day. Yeah, I know what you mean. And like you're someone who's seen it all, you know, you've had your share of fame, fortune. How how did you deal all of this? I mean, you for so many years, you've been such a great ambassador for the game. You, you know, you showed up and you're still promoting and you're such a great ambassador till today you know you're the way you are it's just amazing i i want to know like how how is it for you what was like okay tell us the perks of being the the money maker you know well like, the, did, the perks are obviously you know i get bought into events i get i mean basically if i want to go play an event i can usually call a venue up and say hey i want to come play you, you know buy me in fly me out whatever so the, the perks are plentiful um the good thing for me is, is I didn't really have to change anything to be an ambassador or to be, you know, someone that promoted the game. I remember there was another uh, main event winner that wanted to do kind of what I was doing. He had reached out to me and was like, how do you get appearances and how do you do all this stuff? Uh, the problem is, is he couldn't change just who he was. He couldn't change his personality to fit doing what I do full time. I mean, it just wasn't his personality. Um, it's really easy for me to go and hang out and, and talk to people and, and be friendly with people. I'm just a naturally, you know, I guess, friendly guy, I guess. I hope um, I don't really have to do any work. This isn't work. I mean, what I do when I go play $50 tournaments, $500 tournaments, $5,000 tournaments, um, the actual socializing at the table and, you know, shaking hands, taking pictures, talking with people, that's not work to me. That's, it's like the easiest thing in the world. So um, it's easy to be an ambassador when you don't have to do any work. I mean, you know, they always say, you know, do what you love. So it's actually, you know, for me, it's just really easy to, to just do what I do. I mean, it just, the, the honestly, the hardest thing I have to do is wake up at seven o'clock in the morning to come here, come here and do interviews with, <laughs> with you. Um, <laughs> it's I'm fun. sorry. No, it, I, <laughs> Anytime I do an interview with anybody from Europe or Asia, it's always, you know, at, at weird morning time, which is fine. I, when my kids were in school, we woke up at six o'clock every single morning. Um, but now that we're in quarantine, eh, we might get up at 11. We might get up yeah. at two. We, we, there's no time. There's no time anymore. I don't even know what day of the week it is anymore. I really don't know what day of the week it is right now. I think it's Monday. Yes, you're right. All right. Perfect. <laughs> So like at this point, uh, when, when you were doing all your tours and you were, you know, now imagine there's a Chris Moneymaker tour also, and there's so many, you know, so many things happen just in your name. Uh, even back then, were you, did, did Hollywood actors or like, did all of those celebrities not recognize you? Cause like, whenever I'm at the airport, two people, two people who every immigration officer knows is you and Phil Helmut, they're like, and even Daniel Negrano, you know, they're like, okay, who these three people are, you know, my idols and they are the reason so many people you, like are the product of the moneymaker effect. You know, so many kids started playing because of you. And today imagine poker wouldn't have been what it is uh, just because of you. So I want to know what's your take on it. What do you think that, you know, why were you, uh, meant to do all of this and what does it mean to you while you're promoting everything i mean it's a huge honor i'll be honest uh you know a lot of people don't realize i wasn't the first amateur or you know i was an amateur that won the world series so that therefore it created the, the money maker effect but the year before an amateur uh, an amateur just as much an amateur as myself won the main event his name was robert varconi um robert's a super nice guy um really down to earth uh there's one big problem with robert though um, Robert graduated from MIT and is a very, very, very smart individual. And he comes across as a very smart individual. So people cannot relate with him 
um, when he won the World Series of Poker. You know, he's not an, he's not a pro. He's an amateur, but he's a super smart guy. Well, most of the people think that if you go to MIT, you go to Harvard, you know, you go to some of these really top schools that people are smarter than you. Well, fast forward one year and you see some dumb redneck from Tennessee win the tournament and like, well, hell, if that idiot can do it, I can do it. And that was really what the, the premise of the moneymaker effect was. It wasn't so much that an amateur won the tournament. It was an amateur that people saw that they realized if he could do it, I could do it. And that comp uh, with a combination of a couple different things, um, online poker was just taking off so people could readily go on and try to learn how to play. And, you know, you could jump onto poker stars and play for free. You could play for pennies. It was really easy to do so. Um, and then the amount of learning materials became to became readily available so people could actually start learning how to play the game properly and actually make money at it. If you actually started 2004, 2005, 2006, all the way up to like 2009 probably was just ask anybody from that time. Um, it was a magical time for poker. I mean, I could literally take someone off the street who'd never played poker before teach them how to play poker in like two hours, send them to the casino and they would make money. Um, it was just printing money back then. Um, and, you know, obviously everybody wants to go back to the, the moneymaker boom or all this other stuff. Uh, unfortunately, you know, people are educated now. There's so much out there that people can learn. So you're never going to get back to that the way it was. Um, again, we would play sit and goes. And if you sat out, if you just sat out of the sit and go for like the first three levels, you would be down to three handed because people would just yeah. go bust. It was insane. Uh, people didn't know what ICM was. People didn't know, um, you know, I remember when in like 2005, when people would squeeze, it was like the new hit thing. People didn't think in terms of ranges. It was just a different life. Yeah. But so that all started because people saw me win the World Series and thought, Hey, I can do that too. Yeah. Uh, Pratik Joshi, uh, he asked also, he's like, do you think in today's competitive field, it's realistic to turn $86 satellite into 2.5 million? Um, I mean, you know, compared to how different the game is today. So do you think that is possible? Like that kind of ROI? Of course it is. We just had a guy from Brazil uh, play on Poker Stars, and he won like the, the biggest... Um, uh, online tournament in history or whatever. Uh, Roman Ciala, uh, Roman just won the PSPC last year. He was a Platinum Pass winner. Um, he turned a small amount of money into five point some odd million. Uh, you see it happen over and over again. So yeah, it definitely can still happen. Um, obviously, it's tougher. And I'll play with people that have zero percent chance of ever winning a tournament or ever doing well because they're just a little bit too passive. The one thing to be a uh, you know a winning poker player or to win one of these tournaments, you got to have kind of a messed up mind. You have to be aggressive and be willing to die. Um, it's kind of what you know is one of the the traits of a poker player that really you need to do. You need to have the responsibility to play within your bankroll, but also once you put your bankroll on the table, be willing just to say screw it. I'm gonna you know I'm gonna go for it. And um, it's a really difficult mindset for a lot of people to have. So when people think that if he can do it, I can do it. Um, people got to realize like there was a point in my life where I had 50 bucks to my name and I decided to bet on the jets instead of eat that day. I mean, you got to have a really messed up mind um, to, to be a professional poker player sometimes. And yeah. it's not just for everybody. You know, you have to be aggressive. You have to be willing to go for it. Um, and obviously if you're going to be a successful poker player, you got to be able to manage your bankroll and do things off the table as well, which are skills that I learned later in life, which definitely are really good skills to have. Yeah, you have some of the strongest bankroll management skills coming like because you're an accountant and, you know, that's your natural background. What advice do you have for Indian poker players to um, how do they manage their bankroll? Just a quick just a quick tip that, you know, they don't hear every day of their lives. Well, no one ever. Uh, plays proper bankroll management. Let's go ahead and put that out there. I mean, if you're playing in a cash game, you want to have 100 buy-ins on average to play in that cash game, which 
Um, I don't know a single person that plays in cash games that do. You always want to play in the biggest cash games you have, uh, you can. It seems like every every single person I know always gravitates to the biggest cash game they can afford. They don't want to go play one cent, two cent when they can play one two. Um, that being said, if you're a professional poker player, you have to include the, for the variance of poker. Uh, it doesn't matter how good you are if you go broke because um, you're playing too big. You know. That's, and again, but that's why every single person I know that plays bigger than they should, they're all broke. They're all, you know, they'll be rich one day and then broke the next. Yeah. Um, so proper bankroll management is a very, very tough skill. And it's one that I, I think anybody, if you want to be a poker player, it's probably the most predominant skill that you need is to be able to manage your bankroll and realize, um, and be, you know, there's a difference between a, a, a bankroll and your expendable money. A poker bankroll is what you're doing for your life. Like you can't replenish it. It's, you know, you're not gonna get a paycheck and then put more money to your poker bankroll. Um, Cause obviously your poker bankroll is bigger than you if you can put more money to it. Your poker bankroll is all the money you have to, to put towards poker. Um, you know, people will ask me, well, you know, I've got a $200 poker bankroll. And I said, well, what happens if you lose the $200? I was like, well, I'll just put 200 more on. Well, that's not your poker bankroll. Your poker bankroll is, you know what if you have two hundred dollars online then your your bankrolls probably are on two thousand um, dollars you know i would always plan super big games and uh for what my role was online but you know so for example if i have i don't know two thousand online and i'm playing five ten plo obviously i'm not rolled to play that back in the day but i mean i would just send more money down so that wasn't my bankroll um, but again the best piece of advice i can give is just be aware of, you know, you want to only be playing without 1% of your bankroll in any tournament. And if you're buying into tournament uh, cash games, I mean, you're going to take shots. Shots happen, but your shot should be just that shot. If you see a good lineup, you see people that um, you can exploit or you think that you're better than, well, then, yeah, go take a shot for, you know, maybe 10% of your bankroll. Um, I wouldn't do it very often, but it's definitely something that I've done. And uh, I think every person I've ever known has done. So, uh, I mean, there's a lot of tournaments online these days and people are planning out their schedules um, because of lockdown. I feel like online poker will boom in the coming years and it's going to leave us really vulnerable because say if you're in, in makeup and you're, you know, you're not making money and your poker bankroll is not really, you know, going plus, then what do you think one is supposed to, what's the, what's your advice? Obviously take a break. But then what and, you know, work on your game, all of that. But do you do you advise them to go back down to micro stakes and again, grind it up all the way back? Is that what you recommend or do you think, you know, they should, you know, again, take a shot is what what we were talking about? I would never take a shot when I'm when I'm down on my luck or running, running poorly or not making the best decisions. I mean, you're, you want to take your shots when you're playing good, you're on a zone. You've been hitting good. You, your bankroll's increasing because that's when you're playing really well. When you're playing, when you're running bad, um, you're generally playing bad as well. Um, so, as bad as it is, you take a break. You do some studying. You do you do those things. Um, you know, there's a reason why people say to do that, and it, it is it's going to clear your mind. It's going to reset. I mean, even when you're running good, if you play poker every, I mean, that's the, the bad thing with this lockdown is there are some people that are playing poker just nonstop online. Um, you got to take breaks. You got to do other things. You got to clear your head. You got to reset. Um, so if you're running bad, you're in, in uh, you're in makeup or what, whatever the case might be. Um, well, first of all, let me tell you anybody that's in, in makeup, um, I would advise you to try to figure out how to get out of makeup, work with your backer, try, you know, do what you got to do. It's always better to play on your own bankroll if you possibly can. If that means playing and in, instead of playing in the hundred dollar tournament, you play in the five dollar tournament because that's what you can afford. It's going to do a couple things for you. One, it's going to be a much easier tournament. I mean, I know that you want to go play in the hundred dollar tournament and win this big bankroll, but you got to be smart. Play the five dollar tournament, win those tournaments. Um, much easier field, much easier way to grow your grow your um, bankroll. It's not as glamorous. It's not as as fun. Um, 
you know, you can play satellites, but I wouldn't go crazy playing satellites either. Um, just because some of the satellites can burn your money pretty quickly trying to get into these bigger events. Um, so if you are deep in makeup or you're just struggling, you know, it's definitely take a break, walk away. Um, you know, when I say take a break, don't take the day off, take four or five days off, you know, go build a garden outside or, or, or just do a project, do something to get away from playing online poker. Um, and even when you're winning, I mean, if you just want a tournament, um, take a break. It's, it's always good. You know, unfortunately I have several friends that won a big tournament and then all of a sudden they'll go play a big cash game, um, online or live either one. And they'll end up losing a big portion of what they won. And then they get upset because they want to get that money back that they lost and they end up chasing it and going broke from a tournament they had just won. Um, so even when you have success, it's always good just to step back, reassess everything, start back from scratch. I mean, after I won the World Series of Poker, you know, there's been for years, there's been people telling me that, you know, I'm broke because I'm playing 2-5 or I'm playing 1-3 or 5-10. Um, that's the games I've always played. I don't, just because I won the World Series doesn't mean I'm going to go play 5100 all the time. Now, I've played 5100, I've played 100, 200, but those games are against Ben Affleck and Toby Maguire and Leonardo DiCaprio and, you know, games where I feel like I have an edge. Um, you played with, uh, did you play with Leo? I did. I, I got a funny <laughs> Leo story. I was, I was in Hollywood and uh, I'm at a party in Hollywood and this guy comes up behind me and puts his hands on my shoulders, goes, dude, I'm a huge fan. And I turn around and it's Leonardo DiCaprio. I'm just like, what? You know, it's, you know, really surreal experience. Um, yeah, it's been, it's been a pretty wild ride. <laughs> But, you know, I don't play, I don't play like 100, 200 or, you know, even 25, 50 against top level competition. There's just so many other spots and so many other opportunities uh, to make easier money. And uh, I'm not the, the one thing that I think one of the big assets I have as a poker player is I don't have any ego. So I can go sit and play in a 2-5 game while there's a 5-10 or 10-20 game running. <laughs> And not care. I don't care what people think about me playing the smaller game. If I feel like I have a bigger edge in the smaller game, I'm going to go play the smaller game. And also the smaller game might be more fun. I mean, a lot of times when you play some of these bigger stakes, um, obviously you can sit there and people aren't being sociable. They're not being talkative and it can get kind of boring. You know, the, the two five game might be a lot more fun and you might just life choices might be more enjoyable for you to sit there and play with those guys as they're drinking and having a good time. Now the reverse can be said true. Sometimes you play a two five game and it's the most boring game on the planet, but the big game they're cutting up having a blast. So that's the game you want to go play if you can afford it, obviously. Um, but you're, you know, a lot of your, your table choices that you need to make are for, you know, positive life choices, something you're going to enjoy as well. Yeah. Aditya Vadwani is asking, uh, your, he says that you have a very humble approach in life. How do you manage to keep things so enjoyable since poker has become so serious these days? And also, do you have any fun ways to put people on tilt using your <laughs> name or something? Yeah. Um, well, the first thing is I don't go play a bunch of $10,000 tournament buy-in buy tournaments. I mean, when I, I play one or two events during the world series. I go and I play events for poker stars. A lot of them are smaller events. Um, so I keep the stress off myself. I mean, I, I approach this a little bit differently than most. And the fact that I am a, an ambassador and um, I get to enjoy what I do, which is just hanging out with people and, and communicating and talking with people. And I don't have to sit here and grind out $10,000 buy-ins against super crushers all the time. Um, so it's easy to keep a positive attitude and have a good time with it when you're not currently under the stress of, you know, making multi-million dollar decisions on a poker table every, every day. Um, and as far as like tilting people, I, I'm a big needler. I like to needle people. I like to make fun of people. I mean, you're in the group chats with me. So you see me picking on Sproggy or whoever or Brandon. <laughs> I, I Sproggy. <laughs> I pick on people relentlessly. That's what I do. Um, and usually people, I, I only pick on people I know that can take it or usually that will throw it back. I mean, I've got a very thick skin. I get, I encourage people to pick on me. It, it's, you know, I give as, as well as I can take. And um, so I'm, I'm constantly pe needling people at the table. 
Um, you know, if you play a hand really bad and I think that you're, a, you know, a funny person, you'll take it. I'll be, wow, you really messed that hand up bad. Um, but then, uh, you know, obviously there are times that um, I'll be needling somebody and it's just not the right time. Maybe they just lost a big pot and I misread the situation and they didn't want to hear me say it. So and I'll put them on tilt pretty bad when I say something. And um, usually I retract it and, you know, go back. And I remember there was one time I, there was a guy, he was about three or four years younger than me. But I was like, wow, you look really old compared to me. And uh, I guess he was really sensitive about his age. I would never say it to a woman, but like to a guy, I'm always going to say, wow, you look old. Yeah. And I look really good. You look old. And, you know, obviously I'm just joking around, but he didn't take it very well. So, so every once in a while, you know, I have a pretty good judge of, of who I can need on who I can't. Um, but every once in a while, you miss the mark. I saw uh, this uh, heads up national champ. champ what is it? Heads the up. NBC, uh, the NBC heads up. Yeah. And uh, I think you beat, um, you were playing, you beat a lot of rounds, but then you got heads up with D next. And then he asked you, did I fold all the hands right? And you were like, no, or something when he was leaving. Do you remember against that? Two? Against two? Daniel Negrano. So, yeah, he asked you that, was, did I make the right folds? Because he folded a lot of hands to you, but then he did end up winning it. And I remember you walked off because you were like, I don't want to see when I'm all in and all of that. And like, it's like, a, it's one of the, you know, clips on YouTube. And, and then the funny thing is that like, uh, he's asking you, did I make the right folds? And you're like, no, I don't think so. And then you just walked away. So I was like, okay, that's, you know, it's just someone who, who like doesn't care about the pros. And he's like, okay, I'm, I'm here for my own thing. You know, you don't think that, uh, you know, I'm like, I would be like so nice to play with you, you know, good game. And, you know, I would be like that, but you were just like, no, no, you, you didn't do that. <laughs> so generally, you know, I feel like you're a fun person and you, you know, you keep the bat. The well, I try to treat everybody the same way. I mean, if you're a poker pro, a celebrity, or or whoever, I'm I'm gonna treat you just like you would if, you know, you were working, you know, a, a small whatever job. I mean, I don't treat people differently based on um, their accomplishments, who they are, how much money they have, or I basically treat people how you how they treat me. If you're gonna be um, rude to me, I'll be rude to you. But if you're nice to me, we're gonna we're gonna get along just fine. Um, obviously, you know, people like Sproggy, for example, if he cuts up with me, I'm going to cut up with him back and, um, we'll have a, you know, a fun time just ribbing on each other. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, you know, someone like Daniel, I, I, I respect Daniel. I think he's a great player. I think he's a great person, but, um, I'm not gonna, you know, say anything that, um, like, I don't know. I don't know the best word to look for, but I'm going to treat him just like I would treat anybody else. He's not, he's nothing, no superhuman or no, um, um, I don't, the, the, I guess, you know, there's only a few people on the planet that when I saw him, I would be like, Oh my God. And the, the only instance I've had of, of that actually happening was Michael Jordan back in the day. Um, you know, growing up, he was my, I, you know, I don't say idol, but he was a, a guy, you know, he was the, the sports star of my generation. And um, so him, Peyton Manning, um, and then probably Kathy Ireland, if anybody knows who that is. Um, those are probably the three people. If I saw him, I'd be like, wow. And I've seen two of the three. I've seen Peyton Manning. Peyton Manning actually lived in the apartment uh, beneath me in college. And then uh, I've met Michael Jordan down in the Bahamas. Wow. Okay. Now I get it. I have another question from Praveen Jain. He says, most of the regs have a grind routine of 12 to 16 hours a day, where they are left with literally no time to balance out the other aspects of life, such as working out, socializing, spending time with family, friends, eat, eating healthy, even lack of sleep, sometimes leads to an unfit body, unfit mind, and in many cases to loneliness and depression. What would be your advice to everyone out there balancing this aspect of life with the game? How do we strike the balance? Well, as you can see, I'm really, really healthy. Um, <laughs> I, I don't keep up the um, the body image I should. You know, it's, it's tougher when you get older. But uh, to answer your question, it, it's honestly, it's one of the toughest things a, a professional poker player can do. Um, and I agree. You know, I, people want to, to play poker um, and they want to feel like they're being 
productive and working. And um, when you're playing poker, you can get into these spells where you just go and you play non, especially when you're running good, you just feel like, you know, you want to play, 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 go to sleep. And I've, cause I've, I've gone through periods like this where, you know, I'll play and then I'll be running so good. I, I'll, I'll go take a four hour nap and jump right back on and start playing again. And I wake up and it's a week or two later and I'm still just grinding nonstop. And again, I've, you know, got my workstation littered with drinks and cause I haven't moved and my family's like, dad, what are you doing? Or, you know, um, it's just, it, it happens to everybody. Um, the one thing that you just have to be aware of, and that's one thing that I've been really fortunate for with my wife is she does make sure that I'm really balanced and she makes sure that um, there are other things in life. And I've just learned throughout the years that you just got to step away and um, make a schedule for yourself. I mean, don't start, look at the tournaments that you want to play or the, the games that you want to play and set that schedule and really stick to that schedule. So if a tournament you want to play starts at 5 p.m., don't log on at 1, at, on, at 1 p.m. to play that 5 p.m. tournament. Go exercise, get, a, get something yeah. done. Because once you start playing poker, you're not going to stop until you go to bed, generally. Uh, the majority of people that, especially that have this problem, that just play nonstop, is once you, you sit down to start playing, you're just generally not going to stop. You'll register for multiple tournaments. You'll just grind, grind, grind. So you really, it's really comes to the, the beginning of the day or the, the day going into tomorrow. All right, tomorrow, I'm not going to play poker until 4 p.m., 5 p.m. I'm going to get all my stuff done. I'm going to, you know, shower, work out, do all the things that you're supposed to do as a responsible adult. And then you can go and, and work, play poker, do whatever. But each day start fresh and make sure that you get everything that you need to get done, whether it be pay your bills, what whatever it is, take care of that stuff in the morning. Because again, once you start playing poker, a lot of times you're not gonna stop. So the morning time to me is the most important time. And then if you do have someone in your life, um, that you is important kids, wife, whatever, um, tell them, you know, essentially I'm going to play one tournament today. When I bust this tournament, I'm going to be out of the tournament. Tell, tell them that and then it'll, it'll hold you accountable to not just go register more and more tournaments. Um, and then go be with those people, take the day off, take the night off. Um, you know, say Thursday night, there's no good, mixed game tournaments there's no good plo tournaments there's no big guarantee tournaments online so i'm not going to play poker thursday nights thursday nights are going to be reserved for my friends my family um getting other things done so thursday i'm going to take the entire day off poker i'm not going to play a single hand of poker on thursday and if you start setting these boundaries for yourself they become easier and easier to maintain and if you do things outside of grinding poker and you have these sets boundaries it's going to do a few, a few different things. It's going to change your mindset. It's also going to make you play better because you're going to get reset and you're going to be ready to play. People that grind nonstop, they get into lulls and they turn into robots and just do things out of automation. When you actually take a break, you, it actually does help your mind to clear and to, to refocus. Um, and it's just going to make your life that much better when you have other things that you have to do. So um, at the end of the day, it's really about just setting that regimen setting, it doesn't have to be a regimen per se, it's just setting a plan for tomorrow. Tomorrow, I'm gonna wake up and do something other than playing poker. I'm gonna have a little plan to do that and to reward myself or to, um, it depends on how you look at poker. A lot of people work at poker as, as fun, as enjoyable. Some people look at it as work. Um, and then some people kind of blur that line. Um, you either reward yourself or you go to work once you get everything else done but you kind of reward yourself or you go to work after you finished everything else. And uh, that's really important. That really starts in the morning time more than anything else. And I think if you do that, you'll find that you'll wake up and, you know, it's like, I don't have to play poker today. I can take the day off. You know, if I had a really good day yesterday, well, yeah, I'll take the weekend off. I mean, I remember back in the day taking Sunday off used to be blasphemy. And it's probably still the same way for a lot of online graders. Taking a Sunday off would be just insane. Um, and it wasn't very, very often that I took many Sundays off back in the day. 
Um, but there were a few when my wife said, Hey, let's go do this. And I'd be like, okay. <laughs> um, so everybody knows Sunday's the day. Sunday is the, the biggest tournament day. But um, once you take your first Sunday off and you realize that you're not going to just blow through all the buy-ins and never cash. Um, and you realize you have that money in your bank still, it's actually a lot easier to take the next Sunday, uh, you know, another Sunday off. Um, you know, obviously Sundays are a lot of fun online, but, um, you know, just try taking one off and, and seeing how it does to you mentally. I, I promise you'll be all right. Yeah, so I hope that answers the question, Praveen. And also loneliness, depression, you can just reach out to your friends, talk to them. I mean, don't make focus so serious and, you know, um, concentrate more on studying. Um, so Gutshot Magazine has a question. They say, how did you balance your family life while being on the road? You know, it, it's different for everybody. But for me, um, I've got a very strong wife. I've got uh, great kids. So... Um, I just make sure that I'm home. I, generally for a long time, I wouldn't travel for longer than two weeks. So I'd stay home for two weeks, travel for two weeks. Um, I would never schedule poker tournaments. Like if I went to a series, it would usually be just a week long series and that would be home. Um, I'm a little bit different than most, you know, a lot of poker players have to go and they have to work and they have to, to, to grind and travel from stop to stop to stop. And it's really tough to have a family and do this lifestyle and have a family. I mean, I think anybody knows that's a professional poker player. Um, it's tough to be a professional poker player and have a family um, because the hours are so unique and um, the swings are unique. Um, the one thing that me and my wife did a long time ago was we discussed the finances. We got that out of the way and then now, like I would go home and say, oh, I lost $10,000 today. It would, she would literally almost have a heart attack. It would, she would freak out. Um, it got to a point where she has mon money that she has for her. And I have my own, make sure you have your own separate account from your family that doesn't affect your kids, your wife or anything like that, that your poker bankroll. And you don't need to tell your wife or your significant other what your poker bankroll is doing, it's it's your poker bankroll. If you lose $10,000, $2,000, whatever that number is, you don't have to discuss that with your wife. You don't have to discuss that with your significant other. Um, and it just makes family time easier than having to have these discussions about, oh, can I get another $2,000 into, into my online account or to, to play live? Um, so that helps. And then also just taking the time to be with them and planning dinners each, you know, three, three nights a week or whatever, you, you plan to have a family dinner and take the night off. Um, the biggest thing to, to really do this, whether it be having a life, being with family, whatever it is about and doing this balance is putting parameters on yourself, putting barriers that say, I'm going to take a break. I'm not going to play poker today. And once you start doing that, it becomes easier. Um, the, mo the majority of people that I know that just grind 24 hours a day, they don't have anything else to do or they, you know, uh, if they, they do just grind, they don't worry about their family, whatever it is, it's because they just get into this routine and they have, you have to break that routine. You have to really take a, a considered effort and say, you know what, I'm, I'm going to do something different today. Nice. Thank you so much, Chris. And okay. So this question is from Sartak. Um, he says, what mistakes did you make in these last 17 years since you won the main? And is there anything that you would do differently if you went back in time? Well, Is of course, there are tons of things I would do differently. I mean, you know, you look back, I mean, one of the, the small little minute things, it was a guy, a guy owed me a thousand dollars back in like 2004 and offered to pay me in Bitcoin. And I told him, I don't want that stuff. <laughs> um, <laughs> Yeah, uh, I, I would I would be really well off at this point. But no, there's always things you look back and you're like, wow, I wish I wouldn't have done this or that. Um, but that's just life. I mean, you got to learn, you know, I, I just my philosophy or my how I live my life is I know I'm going to fuck up. I know I'm going to make mistakes. I just try to learn from those mistakes. I mean, I've done things that um, when I look back, like I cringe and wonder why I did. I mean, I remember being a, a teenager 
one of the games that we played as a teenager is we would drive down the interstate and we would open the car door and hang out the car door as far as we could, like in a game of chicken. And I look back at that now, I'm like, what in the hell were you thinking? You're, you're a freaking idiot. I would put cigarettes out on my hand to prove how manly I was. I mean, the, the amount of stupid things that I've done in my life are insurmountable. So, you know, but you have to just learn from those mistakes. You have to realize that you're going to make these mistakes. Over the last 17 years, I, I probably made more, more mistakes than I care to mention. Um, but I just try to learn from them and try to get better the next day and not make the same mistake twice. Um, I would say if, if there was a few things that I could do differently, it would be not to start a, a slot machine company. That would be one big thing I would not want to do again. Oh, yeah, not, the Money Maker um, Gaming Company, yeah? Yeah, the Money Maker Gaming Company. Don't do it. Um, and then uh, we did a children's clothing store. Um, you know, thank goodness um, between my what I do for a living and uh, sponsorships, I've, I've come out the other side of these erroneous decisions. But again, you know, sometimes you got to take shots in life and um, I don't regret the decisions I made. I would probably still make them again. Um, I hope I've learned from them. I'm trying to get better about, you know, starting a new business that I'm working on right now. Um, I'm not rushing into it, taking a little bit more better, a little uh, more time into it and looking at some of the downfalls and uh, making sure I do it right this time. Yeah. What field are you looking at? It's good. It's in the poker field. It, I'm looking oh. at doing a, a poker type room um, or, you know, a social club. Um, and it was funny because I was about ready to, to look at opening up and then the virus hit. So everything got put on hold and um, we'll have to wait. Uh, and see. Are you going to ever do it online? Probably. You could just... uh, no, I mean, obviously I work with poker stars, so there's never, no, I'm not going to do anything online other than, um, play on poker stars. I mean, hopefully we get back to a point where we can play um, in all 50 states. Right now we, are, we currently can only play in two states, um, yeah. but it's expanding. And um, hopefully, you know, I'll be playing with your audience here soon. And one day maybe we can all get merged together onto one platform and, and play play as it used to be back in the old days where we could all just play. And uh, we all got along just fine. But unfortunately for right now, um, it's just, uh, no, I'm not looking to do anything online. It's all um, a live venture at this point, which given the circumstances and where we're at right now, doing anything in a live setting doesn't look very promising. So everything's put on hold and uh, just basically right now, just hanging out with my family and doing like we're, we're uh, building a garden right now. We're oh. resodding uh, some areas in our on our property, and um, I put down some downspouts and dug some ditches and just taking care of things around the house. Fun stuff. I mean, yeah. you know, I, don't like know, this. I, don't know. I wouldn't call it fun, but um, <laughs> much needed. <laughs> listen, anything that my wife has asked me to do for the last ten years. It's happening it's getting, now. <laughs> it's getting done now. Yes. Amazing. But the good thing is, if once we're out of this, I'm going to have my house. My, I've repainted my house. We've reorganized every room in the house. Um, we've we're redone the garage. We're doing outside. Everything's going to be done. I'm going to have a perfect house. You know, it's all going to be you know updated and uh, pristine by the time we get out of this lockdown. Amazing. Um, Mithil Nagpal is asking, do you feel any performance pressure over the years considering how cutthroat the competition is? Did you, how did you keep on going knowing that it's tough to beat yourself? So, you know, you've already done like the most amazing thing. And now when you're, how do you, what, what is your motivation to, you know, go to a next poker tournament? Because you've done like the, yeah. Sorry, I think I can't ask this question any better. <laughs> you, you asked it perfectly. And the answer, to answer your question is I got a mental coach to help me uh, get over a couple things. Um, I would beat myself up when I made mistakes at the table. Um, and I was hard on myself. And when I played where people, other people were watching, I wanted to play really good poker because – as much as I didn't want, 
I didn't think I needed other people's approval. I liked it when people thought that I was a good poker player. And it was all in my head. I just had to get over it and realize that um, you're going to play bad at times. You're going to make mistakes, and you just have to live with them, and you're not going to play perfect. Every single player plays bad. Um, but the drive to play, even though I've won the World Series, I still have a amazing – drive to improve my game and to be a better player. Um, I made a life choice back in 2004, uh, about eight months after winning the main event, I decided I wanted to be a professional poker player. This is what I want to do with my life. So even though I've won the main event, I still have to work on my game. I still have to try to, to improve and provide for my family. I mean, two and a half million dollars was a lot of money, but when you pay backers, you pay off taxes, I got a divorce, all this money goes away. You have to continue to work at your game and you have to continue to improve. Um, so every time I sit down at a poker poker game, I mean, I'm just trying to make the best decisions and I'm not worried about anymore the mental, you know, what people think about me or um, making, you know, trying to one up myself, if you will. Um, you know, I just want to provide for my family and, and do the, the best I can at the tables that I'm doing. And that's, you know, again, it took a mental coach almost for me to figure this out because I was constantly always trying to, you know, win that next big tournament or, you know, yeah. um, do better than what I did at the world series. And, you know, always really beating myself up when I made mistakes, um, especially when people could see it. If I was doing a live stream and I made a bad play and, you know, get negative comments from people, like, you know, you're so terrible because you um, called off in this spot or what, whatever the case was. I, I, I would let it get to me mentally. This is, you know, 15 years ago, whatever. But I would let it get to me mentally. And uh, that's when I hired a mental coach to sort of block that stuff out and to get those thoughts out of my head, reframe um, the way that I look at um, sessions. So, if I, if I have a bad session, I lose money. Um, I go back and look at the result or the decisions I made, not the results. And all this stuff just helps, you know, in your, your, your framework of your mind. Um, and if I'm not making the correct decisions, then it's time to go back into the, the lab, if you will, and start doing some work and studying and getting better so I can make better decisions. But as long as I'm making the right decisions at the table, um, then I'm, I'm perfectly fine. Amazing. You've worked with like the best uh, of the people out there, uh, such big names and coaches. Who has helped your game the most? I mean, it's really hard to say. Um, like I said, I, I've worked with a lot of different coaches. I've worked with a lot of different players. Yeah. Um, I think anybody I work with, I, I pick up a little bit from. Um, yeah. And honestly, like, there are times when I'm teaching someone else and I learn a lot teaching them. Um, it's, it's amazing when you talk poker strategy with someone better than you or someone worse than you, just to see their perspective and to realize, you know, one of the, the most common questions when I'm teaching someone to play poker is why did you do this? Tell me your thought process. Why did you make this decision? Um, and then usually I'll go back and tell them, why they're wrong or, you know, why this is not the, the method that you should have to be balanced and to be, to create a good poker game. You have to make certain decisions based to, to keep your opponents guessing and to make sure that your range is completely wide. You're not just being very polarized. Um, so, but in asking this question, I get a lot of answers and I use those answers to really learn what people are thinking and how, people are viewing um, what they're doing. But I would say, you know, as far as like actual of helping my game, um, I don't want to give credit to one person because there's been so many people. Um, 
I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to give credit to okay. one person. Okay, done. I know. I know. I mean, they all have been great, and I feel the same, you know. Um, I, I met Jungle Man for a uh, like a podcast for like 45 minutes or 20 minutes. It was like, pre first he, you know, did the podcast, and people kept coming in, so the video got spoiled, and I had to only upload the audio. I swear, after meeting him and talking to him about, like, poker and life and everything, it just like give me that wake up call that you know like and, and in the middle of the dinner he's looking at me and he's like listen I think you should start doing this a lot in, more in your game so you know like a random thought that he just like you know a seed that he planted in my head and I've started working on that and you know now and the, especially the thing that you said uh, especially if you or everyone here I'm sure they're working with different coaches and everything when you're doing your hand history if you don't know the answer of why you did that there's something wrong. Like everything you had to do on the poker table, on each street, like you have to have some reason. Or what. You should know the reason so well because it should be, you know, coming from your, you know, mind, your consciousness and whatever you've learned. So it's, um, I completely agree that not just one person, but a lot of things here and there, you know, make you that person that you want to be at the poker table. Um, I have a question from uh, Poker Guru. Uh, they said that India is still a few years behind um, the US in terms of the awareness of the sport to the average skill level of the player. If there was one piece of advice you had to give to thousands of Indians who are looking to start playing this game more seriously, what would that be? Online poker, that's really the, that's the key to, to everybody that's ever learned this game quickly and effectively. It's getting online and, and playing small stakes and learning what works. Um, you want to have a good group of friends that you respect that are good players that you bounce ideas off of. You, If you have a tough hand, you want to run that hand through a, a, a group chat where people get different perspectives. But really, there's no substitute for playing hands and putting yourself into situations um, and if you're playing small stakes, try different things. Try a five barrel bluff, try squeezing, try limping in certain spots. Just, just try different things um, and see how it works and see how it fits into your game. Um, and that's why, you know, for years, poker was pretty easy to beat because there wasn't all these resources. There wasn't online poker. Um, and then you have where I come on and when and online poker is taking off and people got good because they played online and you learn so quickly. You see so many hands. Um, but if you want to, I mean, I've been playing with people that have been playing this game for 30 years and they're as bad as they were when they first started because they don't try to improve. They play a hand. If they lose, they got unlucky. If they win, it was skill. And that's just kind of their mentality. Most of them are recreational players. They don't care. They're doing it for fun. If you're going to take this game seriously, you got to really look at your decisions and make sure that the, it doesn't matter what the outcome is. You look at your decisions. So if you want to improve your game, go back and look at your decisions that you made during hands and ask yourself, one, why did I make the decision? If it was wrong, why was it wrong? Constantly be asking yourself, you know, these questions, but don't only ask yourself, ask your peers, be, be involved. I mean, like you said, India is a growing poker market. I would say India and China are probably the two biggest growing poker markets in the world right now. Uh, Brazil just went through a massive growth over the last decade. And now you're going to see India and you're going to see China going through these growths. I mean, I go to China and play and they, they treat this game as a, a game of skill. Um, one of the places I do want to come to is India. I can't wait to come out and play in India. Um, it's one of the, the places on the planet I haven't been to yet. I know poker is exploding there. But the one thing that I will tell you is get in a group of friends that play regularly, hopefully with a couple people that are more like yourself, that are better, that have been working on their game, and ask the questions of those people. Don't, you know, come up and, and you can ask a lot of questions to yourself. What could I have done differently? You know, what what if I would have raised in the spot? Was my sizing right? Um, ask these questions to your peers as well. And I promise you, you'll get better a lot faster. Just, just analytically, taking one hand, you can take, I don't know, ace jack and put it, you know, a hand that you play with ace jack 
And I promise you, you think you played it well because you won the hand, or you think you played it bad because you lost the hand. But if you post it with your peers, you're going to get like 10 different answers of how you could have played the hand better or, or you played it well. Um, but just having that peer conversations back and forth is a great way to learn and you'll improve quickly. Thank you. I actually wanted to ask you what would excite you and bring you to India. And I'm so glad that you said that, you know, you're looking forward to uh, coming here. I love um, traveling the world every year with poker stars. I always tell them wherever the new poker tours are, I want to go there. I want to see the world. And, uh, you know, I've had my eye on it for a while now that, you know, it has been growing. I mean, you have the, the GPL India there, which is, you know, it just shows you how, how much the, the country is growing as far as uh, poker goes. And um, I think I would probably have come there this year, I would imagine, at some point, if not this year, next year. But we'll just have to sort of wait and see yeah, how our how poker goes for a while. But, yeah, <laughs> over the ne in the next – whenever we can start traveling again, I want to make it there. I want to come out and, and play a tournament there and, and just see the, see the country and see the people and experience it. Amazing. Thank you. But I, I will need security for one or two people, though. <laughs> I know which ones. You want to name them? <laughs> I'm, I'm not, again, I didn't name my coaches. I'm not going to name my antagonators. And I better not get a question at the end of this. I know it's coming at the end, and I'm going to have difficulty. It's going to disconnect. <laughs> okay, cool. Um, okay, I'm going to try and do this rapid fire with you. Uh, all right. Your all time favorite dish? Oh, pizza. Which one? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> uh, pe pepperoni, sausage, and mushroom pizza um, from Milano's. Oh, yummy. Okay, nice. Uh, if you could plan an adventure for the PokerStars team that sent you for bungee jumping, especially Mel, what would you plan for them? <laughs> if I plan an adventure to go bungee jumping with the team? No, the team that planned it for you. Oh. you remember they sent you for bungee jumping? once and you didn't like it at all no. and I, I i want like if you could pl send them somewhere what would where would you send them what i would honestly you plan? would want to know what their biggest fears are in life. like <laughs> I, I would find out what melt's biggest fear is if you could find out what melt's biggest fear is in life i want i want to we, we need to in because that is <laughs> like, that was mortifying to me i would send them to whatever like if they're afraid of snakes i would <laughs> snake pit for you know to they have to go sit in a snake pit for uh, 30 minutes or something. Oh, my God. I knew something like that. <laughs> so you're you're the snake pit then or the, or the spiders. I'm going to I'm going to tell Mel. I'm going to find out. I swear I'm going to find out. She's in London moving around. But yep. let's see. Yeah, if find out what change... the biggest fear is because we'll, we'll have to do something to enact this. Because, I mean, anybody that's seen my bungee jumping, it was the biggest <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Yeah, I know you didn't want to do it. They were li you literally want to get off the car. As I saw the video. You were like so angry, but just because you're humble and nice, you couldn't say no to these people. And I know well, I could say no, but I, I mean, honestly, I think in life you you got to push yourself and you got to get over your like again public speaking. What we're doing right now, I could never do. This was a huge fear of mine. I got over it and it was fine. Um, yeah. I knew it was something I have to get over. I have to to face it and. I mean, I have no problem telling people no. Um, when Mel asked me to do it, I initially was like, no, nah, there's no way. I'm never doing that. Um, and then the next day I called her up. I was like, you know what? You live once, whatever. Let's do it. Yeah. And it, it did suck. Don't get me wrong. I hated every minute of it. You I'm didn't like it? Did it? I'm sorry? You didn't like it at all? No. I mean. No. I hated it. It was terrible. It was the biggest fear. I mean, I, I felt like I was dying the entire time. I would never want to do it again. Um, I, I did it, but I wouldn't want to do it again. Okay, thank you for keeping their heart at least. Like, you know, at least the team was happy. Um, if you could change something about poker forever, what would that be? Wow, there's so much. Um, cleanliness of the players. People, when you go to the bathroom, wash your hands. Um, and then uh, the stalling aspect of it, you know, getting you know close we gotta we found we've tried to find ways of, of, of you know how to stall um yeah, I could go on on um being more social at the table um not not berating players that you 
deem are better than that you're better than. Um, just treating everybody better overall. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Uh, favorite movie, a poker movie scene. So like a poker scene in a movie. Yeah. Favorite poker scene in a movie. There was a movie called Deal. Um, I've had, seen that movie. Yes. Had Burt Reynolds in it. There was a cameo by a young guy in there, really good looking guy. Um, they were on, he was on the rail and they asked him a question and he, he said something, I can't remember what I said, but it's gotta be that one. It, the, I was in, I was, I had a little cameo in that movie. So I'm gonna have to go with that one. It's either that one or an entourage when I did a little cameo there. Those are my two favorite movie scenes by far. Oh, I have to see these. I'm actually going to uh, put them up. I'm going to put all these focus movie scenes and I'm going to add those too. Okay. Toughest opponent you faced on a poker table. Eric Seidel, I hate him. I, I I wish the coronavirus on him. I'm kidding. <laughs> I don't. He, 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 he's been very difficult for me throughout the year. He's the one that beat me heads up in the NBC heads up. Um, he beat me like three years in a row. So um, he was the opponent. I just I can't get through. I feel like that's that's challenging. And you know, if I have a person like that in my life that I want to beat so bad, then I'm gonna just constantly try and challenge them. And one day, I actually meet them. Like I won't go to bed. Uh, and I just learned my lesson. I don't challenge him. I don't. I don't. If he plays the tournament, I probably just go the other way. I just I just stopped. <laughs> I don't want to. I don't have to beat him. I can just. He just. He has me. He's better than me. Whatever it is, he has my number. I remember we got down to heads up and then we see heads up tournament. And I'd be lost to him two previous years in a row. So I decided just to go get really drunk and try to play him drunk. I figured, you know, I couldn't beat him sober. So I'm going to try and get really messed up and just play crazy and, you know, do it a different way. And it almost worked, but still did not. <laughs> okay. I was going to ask, how did that work out? Um, I got okay. it. I'm sorry. Oh. Uh, apart from the main event, which has been your most memorable poker win? Um, it's a couple different ones. Um, the 10K online tournament um, on Scoop, I played with Oral Hershizer back in the day. Um, it was a cool experience because one, playing with Oral Hershizer, and two, it was the biggest online poker tournament I had played um, to make a final table, and it was a tough field. <laughs> And then the PCA in 2011, um, again, really tough field. Um, playing against all those players, it was it was difficult. I don't play a whole lot of 10Ks, so I would say those two. And then obviously the NBC heads up where I got second. I, I love that event. So um, those were all good. And then, you know, I, I won a trophy in uh, Monte Carlo for eight game. I like playing eight games. So anytime I win eight game tournament, which I don't play very often because they just don't come around very often. Um, yeah. But whenever I can find an eight game mix game, I, I, I'm always going to take pride in winning those. Oh, wow. Nice. Good to know. Um, okay. If your biopic was to be made, who would you cast to play your character? Haley Jail Olsman. Unfortunately, that's who everybody says needs to be playing me. Really? If, yeah. Why? He looks um, just like me, essentially. I mean, people say that, you know, when you. If, if anybody that doesn't know who that is, he was the kid that saw dead people in Bruce Willis, um, the sixth sense, but he grew up and he was in entourage, the movie. He was the, um, the, the evil guy, the evil son and the entourage movie. Um, and okay. I guess he looks like me. So everybody said the, we've been taught. We, I've, I've had some talks with people doing movies and they're like, yeah, this is the perfect guy to play you. Would be, <laughs> hey, would you? Okay. I always thought it was Brad Pitt, but I got informed that that's not the case. Oh, maybe Leo wants to do it. That you know, that would be cool. I don't think Leo <laughs> and me share the same characteristics, but um, you know, I'd be down for that. <laughs> okay. Uh, who has been your least for? Uh, no, okay. I, I don't think I should ask this question, but okay, I will. Who is your least favorite Poker Stars ambassador? Sproggy. <laughs> Why? I mean, his name is Spraggy. Why do you call him Sproggy? <laughs> no, his name's Sproggy. It's always been Sproggy. It always will be Sproggy. I don't know. I don't know who Spraggy is. I'll be honest. I, I don't. I like all the poker stars. Poker stars are, does a really good job of picking their ambassadors. Um, they don't just pick good poker players. They pick good people. Um, I mean, obviously, look at Sproggy. They don't pick good poker players, um, but they pick good people. And I, I do enjoy 
uh, the group chat that we have. I enjoy, you know, getting to know the people and, and, and play. I remember um, there was a time when poker stars went on a massive hiring spree and I woke up one day and they had like 80 new ambassadors and I was like having to look up people because I didn't know who they were. Um, yeah. And, you know, obviously that, that was a different time. The people we have now, it's a lot, it's a smaller group. Um, you get to know them a little bit better, uh, but still, I mean, it's still, I don't, I mean, I don't know you that well. Um, you're, you know, you're in the chat, but you, you don't, you don't chat. You, you avoid the, the haymakers. You're, you're a very civilized chat person um, where I'm in there trying to mix things up and pick on people and get, get conversations started. Um, <laughs> but no, I, I, there's not anybody I, I don't like other than him. Uh, Lex is not really my favorite person either, but I, I thought I'm going to ask you who's your who has been your favorite PokerStars ambassador. Um, oh wow! Again, I, I love all, I love all of them. Um, yeah. If I had to pick one that I guess I want to say maybe I look up to the most or I respect the most or I think is is probably one of the the nicest, coolest people you'll ever meet. It's probably Andre Akari. Um, the guy is just amazing. I mean, he's uh, he's what everybody should aspire to be when they grow up. And uh, I'm happy that I got to know him and uh, be on the same team as him. And if he ever sees this, I will regret ever saying this, and that I'll delete it from from memory. <laughs> No, no, thank you. I I agree. He's, he's, he's a really nice guy um, and a great ambassador for the game as well. Uh, craziest thing you bought with your main event winnings? I wouldn't call it crazy, but I I went. I was driving down the road and I saw a Porsche sitting on the, on a lot, and I went and bought it. Drove it home, convertible, super nice. My wife looked at it and she said, "You're an idiot. You're never going to drive that thing. I can't believe you bought that. That is the worst thing you've ever done." Um, I said, no, baby, I'm going to drive it all the time. So that summer I drove it basically every single day with the top down. I thought it was awesome. And fast forward two years later, I get into the car one day and I've got my oil change sticker in the car from like two years ago because I hadn't driven the car once. Once the fall hit and it got cold, I stopped driving the convertible. It sat in the third bay. After about two years, my wife said, can we sell that car you never drive anymore? <laughs> You're like, yeah. <laughs> Worst purchase ever. Okay. Um, funniest incident at a poker table? I'm sure you have so many. Wow. Fun, funnest incident? Or something that's like, wow. Can that also happen at a poker table? Like our Indian audience want to know. I mean, most of the instances at poker tables that are fun happen when I was drinking heavily. Um, there's been a few hands that I got, I think I won probably one of the biggest hands of my life with queen three of clubs um, in, in a two, five game and just the wildest hand ever. That was a fun night. Everybody was having a good time. And we got in like six bets pre-flop and my queen three of clubs was in a five way pot. I was in second place. Um, it, that, it was that kind of game. It was just really wild. Um, back in the day we had, you know, the PCA, um, we had a spin and go like where I spun in a chair and played like 10 different people heads up, but I had to drink a beer for every time I played a hand going around in the circle. Um, that was a pretty surreal experience. Um, I remember showing up to a poker tournament in my towel coming straight off the beach, which was fun. Maybe not for the players other than myself. Um, a lot of interesting experiences throughout the year. Okay, P. Murthy was asking, what's uh, your memorable hand of your poker career? I think he got his answer. <laughs> there have been like so many. Um, okay, Fanya's reply to the question, is your name really the uh, Chris Moneymaker? Like, is it really Moneymaker? Um, I mean, you know, this is a question I've, I've had once or twice in my life. And um, sometimes I'll just say, yes, it is. Sometimes I'll say, um, no, I changed it, you know, after I won the main event, sometimes I'll say, you know, no, it's really Johnson. And I've had people believing my name is Johnson for like 30 minutes. Um, so it just depends on, I guess, what kind of mood I'm in. 
but uh, I've probably answered it 8,000 different ways <laughs> to a point where if I ever get asked it again, I'm probably going to kill the next person that ever asked me that question. Like literally <laughs> I might kill the next person that ever asked me that question again. Whoever the next person is that asked me that question, I will probably kill. <laughs> Someone in the chat should be scared right now. <laughs> well, okay, out of it's either someone in the chat or someone that might ask. I mean, I'm not afraid to shoot the messenger. <laughs> okay, no. Um, oh, I have a question from Scott. He says, Is Scott your favorite industry professional? Who's Scott? Scott Goodhart. Who? You know Scott. Come on, your boss. <laughs> my, my, my boss. Oh, my boss. <laughs> I mean, Brandon's my boss. Uh, <laughs> honestly, Brandon's like the best dude ever. I, Scott, I, I mean, I, I met Scott once, um, and I gave him a little bit of money back in in, in Dublin, so he would be nice to me. I, I punted off to he played Kings really weird, uh, so I punted off some money to him. But I mean, other than that, I mean, I know he eats a salad, and people call him a hot salad guy, um, but. <laughs> I wouldn't call him my favorite industry person. I think Brandon's probably up there. Yeah. But after what Brandon says says about Scott, then I just I don't know if I can look at Scott the same way again. No, I mean I agree. Brandon is so amazing. Even Mel or everyone, I just love uh, the team. Okay, out of all the shows that you've been a part of, which was your favorite show and why? I, I think Shark Tank was probably the favorite show that I've ever done. Um, actually, no, I take that back. Shark Tank was cool because shark, are you saying Shark Cage? Shark Cage, yeah. What did I say? Shark Tank, Shark Cage. Because I, I was like, you with, uh, Sergio Garcia, and uh, he put me in the cage. That really stunk. But the the best show that I ever did was the Big Game. Um, even though it was playing with Sergio, it was cool. The Big Game was really really cool because we got to change some people's lives. I mean, uh, I played with people that um, when they won the money. Like I remember playing heads up against, I can't remember what their situation was, but if they beat me, they won like 25, 50 K, which is like life changing money to them. And if I won, it goes to charity, which is great, but I'm sitting there trying, you know, it's like so hard not to want, I mean, I want to always play my A game, but you don't want to beat this person that's playing, you know, for life changing money. So honestly, that, that game to me was the, that was the most fun because I was, Fortunately enough, I, I was fortunate enough to lose that to the person, and uh, they they won the money. Um, so it was a cool experience from that standpoint. Okay, thank you so much. Is there anything else that you want to say to everyone watching? And you know, maybe just stay indoors, stay safe. <laughs> oh, yeah, I mean, obviously, you know, it's a weird time right now. Um, I'm I'm in the I'm in the boat of staying in. You know, here, like they just opened up our whole economy here in my state. They're opening it up all throughout the U S um, I'm in the stay indoors, stay safe camp. I don't, I don't think people respect how bad this virus is. So um, you won't be seeing me around a poker table or traveling for uh, the foreseeable future until we figure out a little bit more about um, the disease. I mean, you know, I'm not really, actually that's not true. I am concerned about myself. I mean, I'm a older guy, a little bit overweight. It doesn't do very well with my demographic. But I also have a daughter that has um, asthma, and I know it's not going to be good for her. So I don't want to get it, but I don't want to give it to her. So um, we're doing everything that we can do. I mean, I go, I stay at home, and I come here to this office, which, as you can see, is pretty much a, a padded room of, of nothingness. Um, this is basically the Poker Stars prison where they put me in. Um, thanks for the Scott, by the way. Um, <laughs> So, no, I'm definitely staying away from people and trying to distance myself as much as possible. Um, I know a lot of other people have different views, want to get back to work, yada, yada. Um, thank goodness I'm fortunate enough. I can be social distancing and I can do my part that way. Um, but then other than that, once we're able, I'm able to get back out, I can't wait to come to India and uh, beat up on you guys and teach you all how to play poker and um I know that there'll be a poker festival there um, before too long, and uh, I hope yeah. to make the trip over there. It's, again, um, one of the few places in the world I haven't been yet, and I want to come see, and uh, it'll be fun. You, it you can will be. The city. 
Yes, thank you. It'll be amazing. And um, even be, I mean, even everyone was playing for the Platinum Pass as well in India. And we have someone who won it. And I, I believe he's got more time now to study and, you know, work on his game and actually bring this back to India, you know, this title. I don't know if he's actually spent more time studying. I think he's spent, spent more time on social media. You think so? Yeah. <laughs> Definitely spent more time on social media. Uh, that is the uh, last year's uh, pass winner. I'm talking about this year's one. Oh, this year? Okay. I thought you were talking about last year. He spent, <laughs> he spent a lot of his time trying to figure out how to harass me online. This year's no. winner, I, I don't know if I know that. I mean, um, we, have a, Sharma. we have a Facebook group that, you know, as you know, that we get to know the, the Platinum Pass winners. Um, this year, we're, we're starting to roll that out and get more involved with that. So hopefully I'll get to meet more and more of the winners as, as we do this. Um, I guess we got to figure out when we're ever going to do this Platinum Pass. Hopefully it's still scheduled for August. Hopefully that we get to do it and it'll be fun. If not, we'll, maybe it'll get postponed a little bit. But yeah. either way, hopefully I get to, to meet more of the, the winners. Well, part of the fun thing about this Platinum Pass experience is getting to know some of these guys. I mean, as you can tell from um, just our interaction here, um, there's obviously a gentleman from last year that made a, a big impact. And there, there are several people from last year. Nikhil. Nikhil Sager. That, we don't say his name. No. <laughs> um, there are several people that made a big impact um, on on me and on people. And uh, that's part of the, the fun of the PSPC is getting to know the, the different people and, and personalities. And um, consequently, I've blocked him on social media now. Thank you. So, um, <laughs> Because again, he was trying to ask questions that should not be asked. Um, but no, that's that's the fun of it. So I haven't I haven't met uh, whoever won it this time from India yet. But hopefully, I'm sure he's if he's in the face group chat, I'm I'm sure that um, I'll meet him soon. I know that I'll be getting on there and talking. You know, one of the things that we do as Team Pros is we hold seminars and we offer questions and 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 engage with them on on that platform. Um, and we're starting to ramp that program up. Hopefully, here soon. Um, I think I'm due up to, to, to speak here before too long in that. And uh, it's a it's a fun way to get to know people and to engage and yeah. uh, leading up to the event. And that's what's so special about the PSPC is not only do you get this 25K package, and but you also get to come into a, a chat with all the different pros and engage with the pros, ask questions. And, you know, you can improve your game if you want to or you can just needle Sproggy. <laughs> okay thank you so much you're such a such an amazing um person ambassador everything i'm so happy that you came on my podcast thank you so much wow. and thank you for the viewers for watching and coming in see you next time take care guys thanks for having me on it's great okay. seeing you hopefully see you guys in india take see care you. Bye.